Hey everybody, my name is Jordan. Thank you so much for joining us at The Church Online. If you would like to join us for one of our live gatherings, the church meets in two locations. Our Visalia location meets at 120 South Locust Street every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. And our Tulare location meets every Sunday morning at 830 South Blackstone Street at 10 a.m. We would love to have you and your family join us right here at the church. For more information on what's available for you and your family at the church, check out welcometothechurch.com. Now, let's get started with today's message. Who here has ever had a bad experience at a restaurant before? Raise your hand. Have you ever had a bad experience at a restaurant? All right. Name, tell me the restaurant so I don't go there. No, I'm teasing. Um, is I, I, I love eating out. For me, growing up, uh, you know, everybody's a little bit different. For me, growing up, eating out was kind of like that's a fun thing to go do. It's like, hey, what are we doing? We're going to... We're going to go out to eat. It was kind of like an event. It's something that you do. So I've always enjoyed going out to eat and uh, everything from, from pizza uh, to pizza to pizza to pizza. I really, really like pizza joints. Um, but then, you know, burgers and all kinds of stuff. But there's one restaurant that we really don't go to very often. It's a good restaurant. We've only had one bad experience, so I'm not throwing another rug. But there's, there's one restaurant that we really only go to occasionally on road trips but also, we only go there when someone else that we're hanging with in a cluster uh, invites us to go. And because we just, it's not in our normal flow of restaurants. And um, that's Cracker Barrel. Okay? Who here's, who here's a Cracker Barrel fan? Raise your, if you are, that's cool. I like Cracker Barrel. It's a good place. Okay. Cracker Barrel. Raise your hand real high. You like Cracker Barrel. Okay, Ron, uh, you and I will go out to Cracker Barrel sometime and you buy. It'll be a lot of fun. So, um, is Cracker Barrel. And so we were in Tulsa, we lived in Tulsa for several years, and a friend of ours invites us to go to his place, which is Cracker Barrel. He had this Cracker Barrel, it's his, his, his joint that he always goes to. And so we're sitting there with the white, with our family and with Stan White and his, and his wife and, and, ch- and child, and we make our order. I don't remember what I got, but I remember vividly what Veronica got. Veronica got some sort of like a, a, a big salad, and... Sounded good, and when she got it, it looked good, and she starts to eat the salad. I'm eating, you know, I don't remember what I got. Everybody's eating their food, and so the lady hands Veronica the salad. She starts to eat the salad, and as she's eating the salad, all of a sudden, she takes a bite and goes, then she puts it in the napkin, puts it to the side, and she goes, look, and she lifts up one of the leaves of lettuce, and there's a fly, like the size of a donkey. I mean, it was huge, okay? It was, a, it was a big old fly on one of the leaves. It was dead, and it's on the leaves. And so she goes, <laughs> I saw, I saw, waitress, oh, waitress. And so we called the waitress, and do you know what we did with that salad with the fly on it? You know what we did with it? We sent it back, right? We didn't keep the salad. Veronica didn't, wasn't like, oh, it's just one fly. It's no big deal. The waitress served us a salad with a fly on the salad that's not acceptable to us. So we politely said, get this thing on up out of here. We don't, we don't want it. In fact, we didn't eat the rest of the meal. But anyways, that's a whole, whole long story. The point there is, there are times where you go to a restaurant and you order a certain thing, and when they bring it to you, either it's not the right order, or it's an order that has been damaged, it's an order that has been somewhat, you know, um, it's got a fly on it. In those moments, we think nothing about saying, this is not acceptable. This is not acceptable. Send that back and give me something that's correct, right? We don't, we don't think we're out of line, but here's the problem, though. What happens many times in life is life hands us salads with flies on them, and we just take it. We just take the fly. We just take the fact that the steak was, we ordered it to be medium rare, and they gave us medium well, and we just say, ah, it's okay. Many times what happens, unfortunately, in life is, is we just take what life gives us, and we just take it. No. Not only, not only do we not have to do that, we should not do that. And what happens many times is this, 
is some of our, our, our most prized possession is our spouse, of course, but then also is our children. And many times what happens is, is life sends us children, and as they're living their life, there starts to get to be flies on them. Now, I'm not saying send the kid back, and I'm not saying that, but there starts to be a fly on the child. And many times what happens is, is we just say, ah, it's a phase. Ah, I hope it changes. And we just, or ah, oh, this, this really stinks. And we just keep it. We just deal with it. No. There is hope. There is power. There is change. Through, um, throughout Veronica and I, our, our parenting journey, there's been times where with Jordan, Logan, Michaela, and with Lily, that there's been times where life has handed us something that is bad on this very precious, on this very amazing thing, and life just puts this bad thing right on them. There's been times it's been bad attitude. There's been times it's been bad influences in their life. There's been times it's been uh, bouts of, of fear or angst or anger or depression. And there's all of these things that life has put on our child and he does, and life does the exact same thing with you. What do you do when you look at your most prized possession and there's something there that should not be there? What do you do? What do you do? I was, I, this is some of the slogans I've been saying. What do you do when the terrible twos have gone into the terrible teens? And what do you do when that kid, teenager who used to be really outgoing is now very inward? What do you do when you start seeing they're hanging out with this friend and this friend and this friend? And for whatever reason, it's not about the kid. It's about, man, there's something inside of you that says that's not, that's not acceptable. That's not good. What do you do in that moment? Because far too often what we do is to say, ah, what can I do? No, there's things that we can do. And that's what we're talking about in this series. Is what do you do when your child is in the dip? What do you do when your child is struggling? Last week, we talked about that you need to remember. And we talked about a very famous story in the Bible where Jesus calmed the storm. And we talked about how that you need to remember, number one, this is normal. Is it good? No. Is it right? No. But it's normal to be out on a boat, outside, on a lake, and a storm to come. It's normal to be a parent and to look and see, this is not going to be fun right now. That, that's not good, it's not right, but it's normal for the dip to come in our family. Secondly, as we talked about how that you need to remember who's in the back of the boat, this is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He's the one who calms the storms. He's the one who parts the Red Sea. He's the one who said, let there be light. He can help you with your teenager who's on the phone too much. He can help. And then lastly, we talked about how remember that nothing is too hard for him. That I know your child's not listening, but nothing is too hard for him. I know you found that in their sock drawer, but nothing is too hard for them. And that's what we talked about last week. This week, we're going to get super practical, hopefully a little bit inspirational, but we're going to talk again about what do you do when your child is struggling. And here's this week's points. There's two points mainly. Number one is you trust in the Lord. When your child is struggling from toddler to child to preteen to teen to 20-something when a uh, 30-something years old, when your child that you love, that you gave birth to, that you had taken to baseball games and you took out to eat and you went on vacations with and you were there when they went to the hospital and you took them to the hospital, that child, what do you do when that child, when you look at them, you're like, man, I don't even know you anymore. What you do is, is number one, is you trust in the Lord. This is what scripture says in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 17, it says, But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. And that's, that's the problem. Many times, we'll stop right there. Many times what happens is, is our confidence is placed in our child. That's the wrong place to put your confidence. Your child's going to let you down. Our confidence is in our spouse. Our spouse is going to not be able to handle all of the weight and all of the stress of their life. Many times our confidence is in our job or it's in our boss or it's in our political figure or it's in how we feel, our physical stature. Scripture says... That blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, 
whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in the year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Scripture says that the person who who places their trust not in themselves, not in culture, not in education, not in finances, not in their friends, not in their family, not in their memories, with the person who placed their trust in the eternal God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the person who places their trust in God is like a tree that is planted by a stream of water that has this endless flow of nourishment and water. And that tree digs its roots way down into that supple soil that's been fed by all of the nutrients of this water. And it gets so deep and it gets so strong that its leaves are always green. It gets so deep and it gets so strong that even in times of drought, when the rain doesn't come and the soil is cracked, the roots are strong because it is in something that actually has nourishment. And what happens is, is many times is when the drought comes and the dry seasons come, is we begin to get dry. We begin to have have lack of nourishment because we're trying to, to, to draw power and draw love and draw strength and draw change out of something that has no power in it. Scripture says that we should trust in the Lord because when we do, we're like a tree that's planted by streams of water. That's great. But how do you trust in the Lord? When things get turned upside down. How do you, how do you trust in the Lord when you, when you get that text? How, how do you trust in the Lord when the child comes home, you ask a question that ends up being another question that opens up a Pandora's box of what? <laughs> the what? what do you, how do you trust in the Lord in those moments? This sounds great. Hey, trust in the Lord, right? What do you do in those moments? When it seems like all hell's breaking loose. How do you do it? First off, first off, my advice would be, if things are going great right now, start trusting in God before the dry season. I've seen this so many times where people, they're they're not, they're not trusting in God. They're not going to church. They're not reading the Bible. They're not praying. They're not fasting. And then all of a sudden, the drought comes. And all of a sudden, now, they want to dig their roots down in the stream. I'm not saying it's too late because God's a big God and nothing's too hard for him. But listen, if you want to get through this season, when the dip comes, before the dip comes, start trusting in the Lord. Start trusting in the Lord. But as the dip comes, some of the things that we need to do are, here's two of them. Number one is don't jump ship. Don't jump ship and hold on to what you believe. This is a, this is a segment that I've talked about here at the church before. And I've talked about it at the church before because I've talked about it whenever I was a youth pastor. And I talked about it whenever I was a youth pastor because this passage of Scripture has gotten me through some really, really tumultuous times, personally. So for me, when the drought comes, when the tough time comes, I go automatically back to Acts chapter 27 and this story. What's happening is this, as Paul is on his way to Rome, he's a prisoner, he's on a ship, he's not an authority, but he does have some influence even with the workers on the boat and the commanders in the boat. They start to head off towards Rome and a storm starts to come. The wind starts blowing, the ship starts rocking back and forth, it's getting ugly and ugly real quick. And as it starts to happen, The guards start to get really, really worried. The prisoners start to get really worried. They start to throw things off the boat because they think the boat's going to to sink in the storm. And then they start to say, they get all of the soldiers around, they see land, and they say, jump off the boat. Jump ship. And each man's on his own. But you do your thing, I'll do my thing, but everybody abort. Jump ship right now. The storm's too big. Let's get on up off this boat because something horrible is going to happen. And as they're getting ready to do this, the Apostle Paul, who was informed by an angel beforehand, he stands up and says, no, 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 no. 
No, don't jump ship. For everyone who stays with the ship will be saved. Everyone who stays with the ship will be saved. So they buckle down the hatches and they stick and they stay. And you know what happens? The ship, it runs into this ginormous rock out at sea. It begins to explode, and as it begins to fall apart at the seams, the Bible says that all of the men, some of them were close enough, they just swam to shore, but the others that were farther away, it says that they grabbed on to pieces of the boat that had been broken, and they held on to those for all that they could, and they, they, they floated to shore on these pieces of wood from the ship. And for me personally, when the dip has came in my family or the dip has came with my children specifically, I continually go back to this to myself. And that's why I want to talk to you about it is in these moments when you're looking and there's a fly there, when you're looking and there's there's an attitude there, when you're looking and nothing's changing and they're continually being disobedient, and you told them not to hang out with them, and they are, and it's not changing. You had the talk once. You had the second talk twice. You had the third talk. You had the fourth talk. You've grounded them. You took away everything, and then they did it again. In those moments when the storm is raging right here, and you're going to bed thinking, I don't know what to do, don't jump ship. Trust in the Lord. It is, it is almost countless how many times through the years of, of, of 20 some years now being a, in, in ministry where when the storm comes, that's when people say, I've had enough of God. What? How does that help? You know what? Life is so bad, I'm going to do it on my own. And all of a sudden they start unplugging from attending church on the weekends. Why? Well, you know, my child, you know, it was a tough Saturday night and they're in a bad mood and I, you know, he doesn't want to go and it's going to, and he's going to raise a ruckus again if we go to, we're just going to skip this week. And they skip church one week, they skip church a second week, they get uninvolved in small groups, they stop reading the Bible and they jump ship. No, don't jump ship. In those moments when your child dips, In those moments when your child is rocking back and forth, in those moments when your child doesn't know what to do, you don't rock back and forth. You know what to do. When that child dips, you don't dip. You stay, this is who I am. This is how we live. There is one God. His son's name's Jesus. He rose from the dead. And we are going to go to church today and we're going to worship that God. And we're going to listen to stories about that God. And we're going to apply that God to our life. I'm not letting go of the one single thing that can help me in the midst of this drought. Don't jump ship. Fast. Pray. In those moments when the drought comes, dig down deeper into the roots of the stream of God. But don't jump ship, number one. Number two is hold on to what you believe. Man, you got to, in these moments when life gets tough and family starts rocking back and forth, you got to, man, you got to hold on to what you believe. Hold on to what you know that you know that you know that you know is true. It could be whenever, whenever my son Jordan was was in kids camp and he's 12 years old and he's you know 12 years old you know he's kind of going through you know who is he the teen years are coming it's getting kind of tumultuous I used to be his hero now I'm definitely not his hero anymore at 12 kind of annoying I am to him I don't know why I'm so cool but anyways (laughs) and I remember going to kids camp preteen camp with Jordan and we're praying. And as they were praying over, somebody was praying over Jordan. I was there. And I just saw Jordan. And I know Jordan behind the scenes. And I know what's happening in his heart. And I know, you know, the changes that he's going through. And he's a great kid, but that's getting bumpy. And in this moment when the dip was somewhat starting, the Lord, the Lord gave me a word for him. I didn't tell Jordan know God's voice and he whispered in my ear a word for my son 
And it's, it's between him and me, so I'm not going to tell you what that word is. But there were many times over the course of 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, where the dip happens. And why is he doing that? And what happened here? Where in that dip I held on to, I can see it right now. My son's hands are up and his eyes are closed and he's weeping before God. And I hear him right now whispering that word. And there's been so many times when the dip came that I held on to that word. This isn't him. God already told me who he is. This isn't him. And I held on to it. In those moments when the dip comes, you got to hold on to a word from God. You got to hold on to a passage of scripture. You got to hold on to an image that you ha- hold on to what you believe. And in those dip times, that's how you trust in God, is you don't jump ship. You keep fasting. You keep praying. You keep going to church. You keep serving. You keep living holy. You just dig your roots down, and when they dip, you don't dip. And you trust God by not jumping ship and by holding on to what you believe. So you trust God, number one. Secondly, what do you do when your child is struggling? Number two is, is you don't, you speak You don't speak who they are. You speak who they're going to be. You don't speak who they are. You speak who they're going to be. Oh, man. This this passage of Scripture through 20-some years of being a parent has, for me personally, is one that I have gone back to in my private time many, many times and tried my best to walk this out. Don't speak who they are. Speak who they're going to be. And so many times, especially when your kids hit those teen years, those early 20-something years, and you see them, and you, you, you you see that they told a lie. And it is so, it is so natural in our mind to say, my child's a liar. Well, why? Well, they are a liar. Why? Because they lied. So we speak to ourselves or we speak to our spouse. We don't tell a bunch of other people. We don't put it up on social media. Hey, my child's a liar. We don't do that. But we do it to ourselves, and we speak who they are who they currently are. We speak who they currently are, and we say they're a liar. I can't trust them. They're this, they're that, they're angry, they're confused, they're depressed, and we speak who they currently are. No, we don't speak who they are. We speak who they're going to be. And we see this in Ezekiel chapter 37. In Ezekiel chapter 37, there's, there's a passage of scripture. It talks about that the prophet, he's going through and God gives, him a, God gives him a vision. And this is what he says. He says, the hand of the Lord was on me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and he sent me in the middle of the valley and it was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them and I saw a great and many bones on the, on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry And he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? And I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. So he brings, God brings Ezekiel to this valley and it's full of dry, dead bones. These bodies have been dead for years. There's nothing left on them. There's no sinew. There's no flesh. There's no blood. It's just a dry, dead bone, and they're all separated everywhere. And the Bible says, this is interesting, that God had him walk among them. He, He had to feel it. He had to smell it. He had to sense it. There's death here. And God put him in the middle of this death everywhere. And he said, son, son, can these bones live? And in that moment of mass confusion, he he doesn't even know. He says, God, I don't know. Only you know. This is above my pay grade, sir. I don't don't know. And he said to me, prophesy, which means speak. Speak to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Not, these, not, not my word, not my opinion. Hear the word of the creator of the universe. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. 
I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. And God says, listen, you, what I want you to do is stand in the middle of this death and stand in the middle of these bones and I want you to speak to them. And he goes on and he says, so I prophesied and I, as I was commanded and as I was speaking, there was a noise and a rattling sound and the bones came together bone to bone and I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. So God brings him to this valley full of dead and dry bones. And he puts him in the middle of it and says, stand here. Feel it. Sense it. Can this come to life? I don't know. Speak. This is what you speak to these bones. Son, you don't speak to these bones. Bones, you're dead. Bones, you're hurting. Bones, this stinks. Bones, this is dry. Bones, this is ugly. Bones, I'm scared. You don't speak that. You don't speak to the bones who they are. You speak to the bones who they're going to be. And you listen to me, bones. This is the voice of the sovereign God. Not my voice, Ezekiel. This is the voice of the sovereign God. I will put breath in you. I will put skin on you. I will bring you back together. I will cause you to live again. And you tell them that. So he does. And he stands in the middle of the dryness and the death all around him. And he speaks the voice of the sovereign Lord. Bones, you will live again. Bones, you will not be dead. Bones, you will come together. Bones, you will have skin. Bones, you will have life. And all of a sudden, there was a loud noise. A clattering noise, an earthquake. Man, it got ugly fast. I can imagine the bones are swirling all around him. He's confused. And at the end of it, he sees full-grown men standing. And they look like men, but there's no breath in them yet. And that's so important for us to remember when I get ready to talk about. He spoke once and things changed, but not all the way. So God comes back to him and he said, Then he said to me, Prophesy, speak to the breath. Speak, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Again, he doesn't say, Ezekiel, this is your opinion. He says, this is my opinion. The sovereign Lord says, come breath, come from the four winds and breathe into those that are slain that they might live. So I spoke as he commanded me and breath entered them and they came to life and they stood up on their feet as a vast army. And what happens many times with us as parents is, is we, we walk into our living room and we look around. We walk into our child's bedroom. We get in the car with the kids and once again, it is dry. It is, it is not good. It is rough. It is confusing. And God, many times, he allows us to get right in the middle of the death and to smell it and to sense it. And to see the hurt, and to see the pain, and to see the confusion. And in those moments when we see our child who is confused, or who is hurting, or who is doubting, or who is running, or who is disobedient, or who's just maybe going through a little bit of boy craziness, and we stand in the middle of this, there's a question that comes up inside of us. Will this ever change? I don't know. I don't know. But God, you do. And what God says to us as parents is, speak. You speak to those children, but you don't speak who they are. You speak who they're going to be. And you don't speak your opinion. You speak the opinion of the sovereign Lord. Oh, and Veronica would vouch the same. There's been so many times where we are walking home, where we are talking, where we are living life. And I remember vividly with all of our children at different times looking around and saying, this stinks. This smells like death. 
Everything is broken and it's dry and this is not how it's supposed to be. And I remember in those moments getting alone in my Mazda car or getting alone with my wife, getting alone in my bedroom, walking around the swimming pool for half hours at a time and proclaiming the words of the sovereign God. This is not how you shall live your life. You will not be confused. You will be wise. You will not have lack of favor. You will walk into every room and everyone will know, my God, There she is. You will have the favor of God on you all of your life. You will not be confused. You will not have lack of favor. You will not be tempted and fail. You will walk in victory. You are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. This is the word of the sovereign Lord. And I remember time after time after time after time walking around and prophesying and proclaiming not who my children are, but who my children are going to be. And you know what happened? Just a little bit changed. Just a little. I saw, oh, okay. Oh, a little bit of change here. But you know what? It's not done yet. It's not here. This is outside changes. It's not here. And we got alone again and we prophesied again. We got alone again and we spoke again. The breath of the living God will come in you. You will walk with him all the days of your life. You will be the, I say this all the time to my children, you will be the head and not the tail. You will be above and not beneath. You will walk into every room and have the spiritual favor of the living God on your life because you are alive in Christ. And we spoke it again. What do you do? What do you do in those moments when your child is struggling? When your child dips, you don't dip. You trust in the Lord. You don't jump ship. You hold on to what you believe. And you speak what you believe, which is not your personal opinion. It is the word of the sovereign Lord, the creator of the universe. You speak his opinion over your child. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. His works are beautiful, and we know that quite well. And when you do, a little will change. And then you dig your roots down a little bit deeper, and you don't jump ship, and you trust in the Lord, and you hold on to what you believe, and you prophesy over them again, and then you do it again, and then you do it again, and then you do it again. Until they're out of the dip. That's what you do. So what I know today is maybe a little bit inspirational, but also super practical. And I'm going to be straight up honest with you. In those moments, whenever I'm alone or Veronica's alone and we're speaking the word of God, did we feel the hoo-hoo, the Holy Ghost heebie-jeebies? No. It was dry. And it was tough. Oh, but the joy now of sitting around the table. laughing with my daughter Michaela seeing him stand here and play going down and working in the harvest field with my oldest son Jordan having her right here it was worth it trust in the Lord. You don't jump ship. You hold on to what you believe. Do not speak who they are. You only speak who God says they will be. And you do that again, and you do that again, and you do that again. Why? Because I don't eat salads with flies on them. This is not my life. This is what we do as parents when the dip comes. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name. And oh, Lord, we love you. Lord, we love you. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we just ask you to give us wisdom. And Lord, right now, I I, I pray over every single one of these parents, every single one of these grandparents, every single one of these children that are in the room. God, you are so good to us. And Lord, the dip isn't always something huge and deep. I know we're talking more serious. Sometimes it's the smaller things, but the same principle applies. And God, I, I pray for parents in the room today that are, 
they have a child that they love dearly, but for whatever reason is running from you. I know, I know there's adult children in the room that are running from you, Lord. I pray for their, for their parent, that even though they're in their late 20s or early 30s or even older, that that parent would not jump ship. They would hold on to what they believe. They would not speak who they are, but who they're going to be. And they would do this over and over and over again until you, the hand of the sovereign Lord, brings these dry bones back to life. Lord, I pray for those parents. Don't let them give up hope. You love them more than what you love this child, even more than they do. Empower them today by your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for parents of toddlers, Lord. It could be so confusing, and going to church even is a battle. Why should I even go? They're going to cry in the nursery or cry in the back row and cry in the car seat all the way here. It's going to be easier to just stay home. God, I pray for parents of toddlers that they would realize the power of ecclesia, the power of the church gathering together and pushing through those times and setting the foundation for their kids, even as toddlers. Give them wisdom, Lord. Give them people around to partner with. For parents of teenagers, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would help them when their child dips, that they don't dip, that they stay strong. They have a backbone of stainless steel, as Pastor Parks used to always pray over us. And they would stand strong today. Lord, we love you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.